Hi and thank you for watching. I wanted to make a quick video on something our Heavenly Father showed me yesterday evening. As you may or may not know, several watchmen were recently prompted to look at the 10 day delay in the timing of Pentecost. And I believe without any doubt that this was the Holy Spirit's work to help us to focus our attention on the June 21st to June 22nd date, in which the Feast of Pentecost would then be positioned. And this is of course fast approaching. With everything happening in the world right now, we know that something big is about to happen. And as stated in Amos 3 verse 7, our Heavenly Father does nothing before He informs His prophets of what He is about to do. Yesterday evening I was once again reading Leviticus 23 where the feasts of the Lord are described, and suddenly something jumped out at me that I simply did not see before. As the feasts are described in their order in this chapter, some interjections occur concerning the harvest process. Now in the series that I did on the harvest and temple models and how these help us to understand what is meant in Revelation 20, when Jesus speaks about the first resurrection, we have seen how Jesus fulfilled the first fruits aspect of the barley harvest perfectly. As described to us in Leviticus 23, Jesus was presented as the first fruits wave offering on the morning after the Sabbath, just as described to us in Leviticus 23. Paul also tells us that Jesus' resurrection represents the first instance in an order of events that will culminate in what Jesus pointed out in Revelation 20 as the first resurrection. Please consider the passages that relate to Jesus' resurrection as the first in a series of three events and how it matches the instructions given in Leviticus 23. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath the priest shall wave it. And when the Sabbath was past, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. Jesus was resurrected on the morning after the Sabbath, or on the first day of the week. And in his conversation with Mary, we see how he hints at how he needs to be presented to the Father as the first fruits wave offering, and this being the reason why she could not touch him at that time. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Later that same day, Jesus instructed his disciples to handle him, showing us that he completed the requirements presented in Leviticus 23, before speaking to his disciples. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see." for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. Now in Revelation 14 we read about the earth's harvest, and here we are clearly shown who the owner of this harvest is. And I looked and behold a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. The Son of Man, or Jesus, is the one with the sickle in this passage, and he is the one reaping that portion of the barley harvest that belongs to him. This event is also described to us in Leviticus 23, and the timing of this event within the feasts of the Lord is what jumped out at me yesterday, which is why I would like to share this with you. I believe this is a great confirmation of what our Heavenly Father has shown several watchmen over the past few days, and that is how the timing of what is described to us in Revelation 14 relates to the timing of the Lord's feasts. 
Traditionally, many believe that the Lord's return must occur on Rosh Hashanah, or the Feast of Trumpets. But what does Leviticus 23 tell us about the timing of the events described in Revelation 14? Let's read and see. And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number fifty days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Just as the instructions on how to gather in the first fruits of a harvest coincide with the timing of the Feast of First Fruits, so too does the gathering in of the owner's portion of the harvest coincide with another feast. That feast, of course, is Pentecost. I do not understand why or how I could have missed this connection before. Between the timing of the owner's portion of the harvest being collected and how this is so clearly associated with the Feast of Pentecost. When I saw this, I thought... Well, if this understanding is accurate, there should be a third portion according to the harvest model that represents the gleanings of the harvest that should also feature in this passage. And lo and behold, we see this portion described and being associated with the Feast of Tabernacles. Also in the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when ye have gathered in the fruit of the land, ye shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. We know that this portion that is referred to as the fruit of the land represents the gleanings of the harvest, and God's word shows us that this portion is handed over to the poor and the stranger at the time of the owner's harvest, and the first fruits sanctified this portion of the harvest, and cannot be sold or redeemed for a second time. The instructions as per Leviticus 27 is that this portion has to be put to death if they want to remain devoted to God. Please consider the following passages. In these passages we are shown how the third part of the harvest, the corners or the gleanings that remain in the field after the owner removed that portion that belongs to him, becomes the property of a new owner that is known as the poor and the stranger. The word also tells us in Romans that the corners or the gleanings are sanctified by the first fruits and are therefore holy or devoted to God. So what happens when something that is devoted to God becomes the property of a new owner and no longer belongs to God? Can the original owner buy it back from the poor and the stranger or redeem this portion for a second time? The answers are clearly given in these passages. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Notwithstanding, no devoted thing that a man shall devote unto the Lord of all that he hath, both of man and beast, and of the field of his possession, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy unto the Lord. None devoted which shall be devoted of men shall be redeemed, but shall surely be put to death. In Leviticus 27, we see that the corners or the gleanings can only remain holy if they are put to death. And in Revelation 6, we see this understanding confirmed and applied to those who are known as the tribulation saints. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also, and their brethren, that they should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. Coming back to Leviticus 23, we also see how affliction is mentioned in connection with the time that follows Pentecost. 
and that those who avoid the affliction will be cut off from God's people. Also on the tenth day of this seventh month there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls, and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And ye shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement, to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. You will note that this passage clearly speaks not only of a time of affliction, but also a time when no one is allowed to work. And this follows the owner's harvest. Jesus also referred to this time in the following passage. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. So what understanding does all of this give us? God's word is showing us how specific feasts align with the time at which different portions of the harvest are collected. The first fruits of God's harvest obviously aligns with Jesus' resurrection as the first fruits of those that would be resurrected from the dead, together with the 24 elders. And he fulfilled the requirements laid out in Leviticus 23 to the T when he rose from the dead and represented himself before the Father as the wave offering on the morning after the Sabbath. The owner's portion of God's harvest is gathered at the time of Pentecost, and I believe the fact that this feast is called Pentecost and not the owner's harvest could be part of the reason why I have missed this obvious connection. I also believe that is why so many watchmen were given the same information about a 10-day delay to consider, without knowing about each other's videos that were all produced at roughly the same time, pointing us to Israel's time at which they kept the Feast of Pentecost, which in 2024 would seem to be 10 days too early. The gleanings are gathered at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, and this harvest contains no living participants at the time of its gathering, as all who want to be part of this harvest have to lay down their mortal lives to remain holy to God. For those who still doubt the timing of Pentecost, Jesus tells us in a parable that the good man of the house went on a journey to a far country, which, from our perspective, has already covered about 2,000 years. This is linked to information provided in Proverbs 7, in which the return of the good man from his long journey is associated with an appointed time, specifically a feast day on which the moon is full. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants, and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. For the good man is not at home, he is gone a long journey. He hath taken a bag of money with him, and will come home at the day appointed. The word that is used for day appointed in Proverbs 7 occurs twice in the Bible, and in both instances it is also associated with the time of the full moon. Jesus connects the good man's journey in Matthew 25 to his return, also discussed in Proverbs 7. As I discussed in my previous video, if you have not seen it, the book of Jubilees tells us that Israel's determination of the feast days in the time of the end would be ten days off. As such, when we consider the time at which they celebrated Pentecost this year, we see that it is exactly ten days before the time of the next full moon. Given the situation in the world and everything that is occurring around us, with World War III looming before us, there is, in my opinion, very strong support from God's word for the next harvest event to occur on the next full moon that would mark the true Pentecost as determined by God's heavenly signals that point out his appointed times. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. The next full moon occurs on June 21st or June 22nd, depending on the time zone that one lives in. Do you know which section of the harvest you belong to, and have you made yourself ready as instructed in the word of God to be allowed into and to be part of the marriage of the bridegroom? Time is so short, and you do not want to discover when it is too late, that you missed out on your opportunity to escape that which will soon be coming over the earth. 
If you want to make sure that you are ready, please watch this video, which is also linked in the description below. I hope this video has blessed you, and I hope to see you in the air before the feet of our Redeemer very soon. God bless.